Well, um, thank you very much for, uh, well, for giving me the, the opportunity to present my work. Uh, so like today, what I want to talk about is how we can go from cosmic web scales uh, through filament recognition to the formation of galaxies and taking the special angle, which is trying to see how angular momentum flows from these large scales to the formation of galaxies. And uh, well, given the hype of ChatGPT, I couldn't help myself, but I had also like a, a small mention of ChatGPT and I was very happy because he talks about tidal torquing, which I'm going to talk about. He talks about gas accretion, which I'm going to talk about. It talks about mergers, I'm going to talk about that. And also it like very nicely says that the origin of angular momentum is not yet entirely understood, which is the point of my talk. So I was very happy about that, thanks to ChatGPT. And um, well, the rest is my presentation. Um, okay, so um, just before I get into the details, I just want to broadly separate the, um, the different effects that the environment can have on, on dark matter halo properties and galaxies therein. So the first one that we um, learn in high school and in kindergarten is that uh, the higher the mass of the dark matter halo, the higher the clustering. So essentially you have density effects uh, with more um, massive objects being typically more um, uh, clustered together. Then if you uh, look at a, a bit more subtle effects, uh, you see that for example, galaxies that are nearby tend to align one with another. Uh, the other way of seeing that, which is, um, partially the, the same view, but from a different angle, is that galaxies tend to align with the local cosmic web, and the, so their spin tend to align or be perpendicular to the local filamentary structure. So that's another kind of environmental effect. Uh, and then you can also have like more elaborate um, uh, measurements, for example, uh, some work that Katarina Kroge did, uh, she's online, uh, that for example, if you compute the V over sigma, so this time looking at galaxy properties, you see that there's different clustering of the galaxies depending on where they are in a cosmic web. And so if I want to broadly categorize all, all of that, um, yeah, and of course there are other properties uh, that, that may be impacted differentially by, by the environment. Uh, if I just want to classify everything broadly, I have on the left side uh, isotropic effects, uh, which is not what I want to talk about today. What I want to talk about today is anisotropic effects because they really reveal the fact that the cosmic web is just not spherical cores in, in the universe, it's actually spherical cores with some wires, uh, as Christoph uh, showed yesterday. And I'm probably, and I'm mostly going to focus on angular momentum because that's more or less the first, the easiest property you can uh, guess that you can only create through anisotropies. Um, and so um, what I want to argue today is that the formation of disk and intrinsic alignment are probably angular momentum regulated. Uh, that sounds pretty obvious, um, but um, let, let's get into the details. Um, and um, also angular momentum is a very promising tool to relate cosmology to galaxy formation uh, because first on, uh, on the high redshift uh, end of things, uh, for example, we know, well, at least in simulation, uh, most of the angular momentum is flowing through a uh, cold filamentary accretion and bringing most of the angular momentum, which means that if we want to understand the emergence of, of disks, which are angular momentum supported, we need to understand these flows, which on the large scale and connect to the filamentary structure. And as I um, mentioned before, also at lower redshifts, we also have the problem of the intrinsic alignments, which connects the structure of the cosmic web to the spin of galaxies. Uh, and this is a problem of uh, angular momentum transport. And I'm not going to review like uh, the vast amount of literature that has been done on that, but instead like try to take uh, a fresh view on the problem. Because, um, the difficulty is how to study these, these effects. Like the angular momentum is typically very small in terms of how much uh, galaxies are rotating. So the way typically uh, things are being done is that we take large volume and we try to sample galaxy population by trying to get um, a lot of uh, different masses for the star, for the dark matter halo, for the angular momentum, eventually the position with respect to the cosmic web. What I want to talk about today is a complementary view where instead of trying to sample large volumes, for example, TNG. Uh, we try to keep all the parameters fixed and only vary the angular momentum. And that actually allows us to reveal how particular galaxies, individual galaxies, are going to acquire the angular momentum and how it affects their properties. Okay, um, and before I get into the details, um, the question is like, where are we in terms of angular momentum? 
So the first step, uh, if we want to, well, have a prediction of angular momentum is to go from the initial condition, which I'm going to sketch with that, to dark matter halos. Um, if we use the tidal torque theory, which is um, somehow like the, the regular way of, of making a prediction for the angular momentum, uh, we get some sort of prediction, which we can compare to what we get out of n-body simulations. And then if we measure the ratio between the two and we plot, we plot the, uh, the PDF, we get a scatter that is plus or minus one dex. So essentially, tidal torque theory works qualitatively to give an order of magnitude, but then when you look halo to halo, you get very significant fluctuations. And the, the question, of course, is why? Uh, and then the second step, usually, and we've talked about, for example, uh, HOD today, uh, is if we go from uh, dark matter halo, can we go to galaxies? And can we draw uh, a spin for a galaxy given the spin of the dark matter halo? Uh, and essentially what we find is that the dark matter uh, stellar halo relation is, is quite weak, which means that um, you can have slowly rotating dark matter halo with fast rotating galaxies and vice versa. There is a weak correlation, which is statistically strongly, uh, strong, but it's a weak correlation. And the question is, of course, why is the stellar angular momentum not just tracking the dark matter angular momentum? Okay, um, so that brings me to the, the two plus one question that I want to address today. So the first thing is whether uh, dark matter angular momentum is chaotic or not, uh, or whether it's just that our theory, which I just showed is, is not working that well. Is it a limi fundamental limitation of physics or is it just that our theory is not great? Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is that can we uh, control the angular momentum of galaxies, or another way of saying that is that uh, do galaxies retain some um, memory of their environment? Is the cosmic ray really driving the stellar angular momentum of galaxies or not? Uh, and can we do that in simulation? And finally, uh, I will highlight uh, where I think the boundary is in terms of um, doing a numerical simulation to understand the cosmic ray galaxy formation. Um, all right. So the first thing I want to talk about is whether dark matter, uh, the, the dark matter angular momentum is chaotic or whether the theory is poor. And uh, if you want to sleep for a couple of minutes, the answer is our theory is poor. Um, and let me explain why. So um, here what I'm trying to do is go from a redshift. So here I wrote 100 that could have been any very high redshift universe. Uh, and then you do some simulation, you go to redshift zero. And then typically what you have is a dark matter halo at redshift zero. You can find all the particles in the halo uh, at redshift zero, trace it back to the initial condition. And given these initial condition, can I make a prediction of the angular momentum? And tidal torque theory boils down to writing this formula, um, which looks, may look complicated if, if you're not used to doing that. But essentially the first part is just position with respect to the center. The second part is just velocity. So essentially I'm saying that angular momentum grows as R cross V. Uh, and then you integrate that over the Lagrangian patch, so the region that will later form a halo. So that's the theoretical prediction. The good thing um, is that you can then try to modify your initial condition so that the predicted value is going to be either slightly increased or slightly decreased. And so you can perturb, make a small perturbation on top of this thing and see whether the evolved angular momentum is going to respond linearly to this perturbation. And so you can test explicitly whether angular momentum is chaotic or whether it is not. And the way you do it is that uh, you create a twin simulation where instead of having um, the exact same initial condition, you remove a little bit of matter in the white regions here, and you add a little bit of matter in the blue regions here. This is hand-drawn, that's not exactly what I'm doing. Uh, and there's a principle of doing that, principle way of doing that. Uh, and what you end up with is creating a small extra spin on top of the already existing one. Um, and so you can do that with multiple times with multiple small variation and see how then the dark matter angular momentum evolves. Okay, so if you do that, uh, here time goes from right to left, so that's redshift zero and that's redshift a lot. Uh, and I'm measuring the specific angular momentum in a given region, uh, so a fixed set of particles, I'm measuring the angular momentum as a function of time, that gives me the y-axis. Um, and so the black line here is my reference simulation, and as I told you, I have a way of generating new initial conditions that resemble the initial one except for a small perturbation. And if I do that, uh, essentially what I get is this colored line. So for example, the dark color line, the dark red color, for example, is what I obtain if I multiply by four the expected amount of angular momentum that is going to be generated through torques with the cosmic web. And the nice thing is that I know the initial ratio because that's the input of my simulation. 
And so I can predict that, for example, if the ratio is four initially, I can just bet that by the end of the simulation, it's going to be four. And it, it's, it's, it kind of works because, for example, here I have a value of 20, and I go to a value of more or less 80 uh, in these units here. And conversely, if I divide my initial angular momentum, uh, I can expect that the set of particles that, are, that I'm modifying are going to end up with slightly less angular momentum. So what this tells me is that uh, if I slightly perturb my initial condition, I get a linear response uh, in the evolved universe, so angular momentum is not chaotic. Um, and so here what I'm doing is that I'm keeping the dark matter halo mass fixed. I can measure it in my simulation, and I get a halo with the same mass. The cosmic web is the same except for tiny modifications, and no one I'm sampling is just different angular momentum values. So it's a clean experiment in the sense that I'm only varying one parameter at a time. Um, and I can compare the, so given the black line here, which is my initial simulation, I can predict the other color line given the initial ratio. So essentially I can make uh, a sort of like informed guess uh, of what the angular momentum is going to be by the end of the simulation. And I can compute the accuracy of this thing, which gives me the, uh, this green line. And I can compare to the value I would obtain if I just made the tidal torque theory prediction, which is a gray line. Essentially I can uh, make the prediction four times better than, than tidal torque theory provided I have this black line and I make tiny modifications around that. And if I make, uh, if I allow for larger modification, then the, the accuracy of my prediction goes up. Uh, and if I allow to multiply the angular momentum initially by a factor of four or divided by a factor of four, I'm still getting an order, well, at almost like twice better prediction than tidal torque theory. So what this tells me um, is that the angular momentum of fixed dark matter regions, so I'm not talking about a halo yet, uh, responds linearly. To, modify, to changes in initial conditions, so it's not chaotic, uh, and it's instead behaving, well, linearly, or at least quasi-linearly. And so if we want to improve theory, uh, there are two things we should do. Uh, first is to have a good model of, the lag, of knowing where the Lagrangian patch boundaries are, because uh, if you want to go from a dark matter region to a given halo, you need to know which particle are going, be, going to end up in a halo and which one are not. And I think uh, I can reference the future. I think Marcelo is going to talk about that, and I hope he will, because that's interesting. Um, <laughs> the, other, uh, the other thing is that, um, well, maybe we also need a more robust definition of angular momentum. If it's entirely driven by how exactly you put the boundary, well, maybe it's not a, that good of a definition, at least for dark matter halos. OK, um, so that's the first part. But of course, then I want to talk about galaxies. Um, so what I can do then is I can reproduce the same experiment, but instead of focusing on dark matter halos this time, I can focus on galaxies. Um, and the main idea is that because stars are deeper in the dark matter potential, uh, whether a given star particle is going to be in or out of the galaxy is much less prone to well, being just sitting at the outskirts because there are barely any stars close to the very radius. So in principle, the stellar angular momentum should be more robust, uh, more robustly measured than the dark matter angular momentum. Um, so what I did is uh, run full hydro cosmological simulation with AGN feedback, star formation, uh, and stellar feedback and tracer particles. And I did the same experiment as before. So I decreased by 30%, 20%, or I increased by 20% and 50% the initial angular momentum. And uh, so here, what I'm doing is I'm trying to sample uh, the angular momentum distribution at fixed stellar mass, dark matter mass, and position with respect to the cosmic web. And here what I'm showing is the um, gas distribution as a function of time. Uh, so the times are synchronized uh, with the four simulations. So initially everything looks the same, uh, but close to the end of the simulation, what you see is that there is a measure that's happening here first, and then here, and then there, and then there. So essentially the way I can sample the angular momentum distribution is by delaying or hastening the time of the last major merger and also change the impact parameter. Okay, and so if I do that, uh, what I then obtain is um, I, have, I know my inputs, I know how much I change initially the torque that I'm, being that I'm applying because that's how I modify my initial conditions. And I can measure, at, in this case, redshift two, which is when I stop my simulation, the change in stellar angular momentum here in the total baryon angular momentum there, and in the dark matter angular momentum there. Uh, and long story short, essentially what I'm finding is that if I slightly perturb my initial condition to have slightly less torque, then I end up with a galaxy that is, that is rotating slightly 
uh, well, less fast and vice versa. If I slightly increase the initial torque by the cosmic web, then I end up with a galaxy that's rotating slightly faster. Okay. Um, and, um, okay. And it's also very interesting because now I have, um, so that what, what this means is that the stellar angular momentum is driven by the past tides with the cosmic web, uh, which we can probably pre predict from just gravitation. Uh, and it's also very useful to make sense, for example, of JWST data because you can now sample uh, a galaxy while keeping its stellar mass fixed, its environment fixed. The only thing that is changing now is the angular momentum. So you can probe one direction while keeping all others fixed. And so if you want to understand the emergence of this, that's really valuable. Uh, the other thing that is really interesting is that um, now you have a galaxy with fixed dark matter halo mass. So you can compare, for example, the halo specific angular momentum to the baryon angular momentum. And what you see is that essentially they, they remain on constant retention fractor, fract, fraction uh, tracks, which means that the baryon specific angular momentum in some, is some constant value with respect to the dark matter halo. But the same is not true about stars. So essentially what that means is that uh, the changes in the baryonic specific angular momentum tracks the changes in the dark matter um, specific angular momentum. And so if we want, for example, to do a modeling of the stellar spin, the best guess, well, what, what my simulation shows is that we should go from dark matter spin to baryon spin, and then given baryonic physics, go from this baryonic uh, spin to the galactic spin. Uh, and also what that means is that at fixed dark matter mass, uh, what this shows is that you can have multiple values for the stellar spin while keeping the dark matter halo spin fixed. So essentially, if you do HOD modeling and you only take into account the mass, then there's no way you're going to be able to reproduce that at the level of individual galaxies, uh, which goes in the, in the same direction as what Boriana was telling us today, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, um, and the last thing I want to talk about uh, before my time runs out is um, where is the boundary between the cosmic web and galaxy formation? So I've shown that um, you have a lot of inflow of gas falling onto the galaxy. And so the question is, um, how is the information of the cosmic web transported to the galaxy? And where is the boundary between the two? Uh, and the spotter is that it's probably within the CGM. Um, and I'm by no means doing a, going to do a complete review because there has been a lot of work on that. So I'm just going to give my two cents on the on the, on the question. So the first thing uh, you can do is, for example, you can measure the um, realignment of the spin as the gas is being accreted. So what I'm doing here is that I'm measuring the angular momentum of gas as it's being accreted on the galaxy, and I can measure um, its angle with respect to its value when it crosses one very radius. So the left panel is the angle between the value it had at three very radius to the value it has at one very radius. Second one is respect to RV over three, and the last one is RV over 10. And so what I usually consider a CGM is anything that is between one third of the very radius and one tenth. Uh, and blue line is, so the x-axis is time and the y-axis is the cosine of this angle. Essentially what you see is that uh, from three very radius to very radius, you realign a little bit. Uh, then when you get closer to RV over three, you start being realigning more and more. And when you go from a third to a tenth, then you actually realign a lot. Um, so what that means is that most of the realignments of the angular momentum happens in what I call the CGM, so one third of the rear radius. And the longer the gas remains in the CGM, the longer it will have to realign itself with the disk. Which brings me to my last slide, uh, which is very ongoing work. So uh, it's preliminary, it's written here. Uh, what I'm doing here is that I'm measuring the time it takes to go from one very radius to a third of the rear radius. And as expected, the cold flow take, uh, well, they fall faster on the galaxy. But then surprisingly, if you measure then the time it takes to go from one third of the rear radius to forming a star, you actually see that at lower redshifts, you have an inversion with uh, hot gas taking less time to form stars than cold gas, which is slightly surprising. And what that means is that um, cold flows may not be the fast track to star formation, uh, but that's, that has to be confirmed because it's written in very big that is preliminary. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about that because I see that Avisha is frowning. Uh, so that brings me to my conclusion. Um, so what, I, what I've talked about is that the dark matter um, angular momentum responds linearly to perturbation. So, um, so it's, it's not chaotic. 
uh, the galaxy angular momentum retains some memory of the cosmic web, so the galaxies may be less stochastic than expected. Um, and also finally, um, if we want to improve our understanding of the uh, coupling between the cosmic web and galaxy formation, um, the transition zone, the buffer zone that we really seem to be where most of the stuff is happening is a CGM, so one sort of a variety for me, where we essentially switch from a gravity-dominated gravity regime where everything is just falling to a boring dominated regime with much more complicated interactions. And with that, I'm going, I'm going to stop. Thank you, Quentin. Questions? Uh, does the dependence on perturbations, have you tried with different mass halos or? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so um, the masses of the halos I was showing were uh, anything above 10 to the 13. So it was mostly uh, between 10 to the 13 and 10 to the 14. I didn't go to lower masses, uh, except for the galaxies that are hosted in halos of 10 to the 12. So essentially anything above 10 to the 12 I tested, and anything below, uh, I need computational time to do it. Um, but I would expect that the lower the mass is, the less control you have over the angular momentum because you become more and more dominated by nonlinear interactions. Um, but that's, that's just an educated guess um, to be confirmed. Have you checked that the stellar mass is not impacted when you change the torque in the outskirts? I mean, obviously the halo mass is not going to be much impacted, but what about the stellar mass? Because um, you, you, you wrote P of J yeah, given yeah. M stellar at some so, point. So the, um, the stellar mass of, so the stellar mass contained within the VR radius is, remains constant within 5%. And so does the dark matter halo mass uh, in my, so in these simulations here, the stellar mass remains within plus or minus 5%. So, yeah. We have another quick question. Uh, have you, uh, uh, considered uh, what would happen if instead of focusing for the full dark halo, you would only look at uh, what is happening to the inner dark halo um, as a proxy for what happens to the stars? Um, no, I have not. Because um, it would be interesting to see if it's specifically baryonic effect or if it's an uh, inner region effect. Yeah, um, I, I have not looked into that. Um, but that, that would be... Uh, I mean, I, I think that's uh, it's pretty well... Uh, I think that the alignment of the spin of the inner halo with the spin of the galaxy is much better than the total halo with respect to the galaxy. So I would expect that's my, that these things, um, I would expect these things to look more like a constant retention, retention factor if I was looking at the inner halo specific angular momentum instead of the star angular, angular momentum. Um, but that's to be, yeah, that's to be confirmed. Actually, I would have almost uh, remarked on this as well, uh, because the, back in the old days, people looked at the reduced angular momentum as a proxy for the stars, which kind of downweights the outer parts. So, yeah. so yeah, nice, nice talk. Uh, I have a question. So, like, like you also told me many times that there are like, two sources of problems. Uh, one is uh, how well you know the protohalo region. Mm -hmm. And then there is the approximation of tidal torque theory yeah. that uh, is an additional source of error when you expand in, in, the, in the powers of the inertia tensor. Yeah. Uh, but I, then I, I didn't quite catch which, uh, if you can comment on how, how you, you, yeah. you improve on both sides. Yeah, so, um, so essentially if you know the black curve here, uh, you can make, given the black curve, which uh, we, you can, so if you, if you look at the black curve here, that's my original simulation. So it, it's a prediction of the growth of the angular momentum. Uh, it's not a first principle uh, prediction because it's, I mean, it's an unbody prediction. It's, an, it's a prediction nonetheless. Um, so if you have this one, then you can improve the tidal torque theory prediction of the angular momentum of the patch by a factor, well, depending on how much you allow the fluctuations to be, by a factor between two and four, essentially. Um, the other thing is that if you then want to cast this result into a prediction of the halo angular momentum, not only do you have to be able to predict this black curve, but also to predict which particles are going to be in and out of the halo. 
So essentially, we have like two different distinct problems, which is first making a first principal prediction of this black curve, which I don't know you had to do, and then also like uh, paint which particle are going to be in or out of the halo. And uh, I should say that if you, when you go from the black to the red, for example, then the particle that comprise the halo will change. Uh, so even though this black line here tracks all the particle that will eventually form a halo, it's not the case in any of the other curves because some, some particle would be in, which were not, and, and vice versa. Um, so if dark matter halo and uh, galaxy, uh, uh, that, uh, halo spin and, and the galaxy spin don't coincide, uh, does it mean that baryon comes from a different patches? Um, or that, is there something else? So, so that's my guess. Um, and uh, that's that's something that I'm looking into. I try to see how much the baryon uh, Lagrangian patch coincide with the dark matter Lagrangian patch. Um, I would expect that it's not exactly the case, just just because, uh, well, just like the amounts of stars within a galaxy is not just the cosmic abundance; it's less than that. So, just based on the the, the mass of baryons within the galaxy, you know that it's less than cosmic cosmic abundance, so the volume has to be different already. So it has to be slightly different, but then whether it's completely misaligned or not is an open question. Other questions? We have one there. Maybe the next speaker can already come forward. In the middle. Uh, uh, I was just curious when you showed this plot of the alignment as a function of time. Uh, yeah. You know the cosine is. Can you show them again? So you you show the shaded areas, right? Uh, for example, the the plot on the the, the right panel. So uh, is a, are the shaded areas a scatter or a, yeah. an error? So it's yeah. just so it's a, it's a scatter uh, given a very big sample of uh, three four galaxies. Um, okay. So why do you start from a very low scatter to a very to a larger scatter uh, as a function of time? Do you have an idea about that? Oh, you mean here? Yeah. For example, so here you see you almost no scatter, and the idea. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. But also, like, if you look at the time, it's like redshift ten. So you can expect that all the angular momentum of the disk is going to come from whatever has been just accreted, so you can expect that there is going to be... Um, well, you can expect a, uh, like a cosmic well, a, a evolution with time just because initially all the angular momentum that has been accreted uh, is what sets the, the spin, but then the spin of, for example, the, the things that are here, if, if you have the, the disk that is relying the the accreted gas, then the disk angular momentum is the integrated history of the angular momentum accretion. So you can expect that there's going to be slightly more scatter. Um, yeah, I'll think about that because that's a good question. Uh, okay, thank you, Claude.